So if you grew up going to Sunday school, most likely you learned a lot about David, starting when he was a young person who killed the giant, Goliath, and was, became king. What I'm going to read today from 1 Kings is about the end of his life, and then who follows him. So from the second chapter of 1 Kings. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned for seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. And then from the third chapter of 1 Kings. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare to you. If you walk in my way, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Our gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 6, 51 to 58. An interesting, if enigmatic, passage, a lot in it. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very true, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh 
and drink my blood, abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Thanks be to God for this word. <clears throat> when I first began preparing my sermon, and by the way, if it gets near to noon, let me know. I'm not going to take my watch off and, and look at it. Pat, who I've mentioned before, my wife and the pastor of this church offered to help. I'm just trying to keep you from embarrassing yourself, she explained. But we quickly agreed that that was a lost cause. Besides, I told her, that topic's community, something I'm well versed in. You see, while not a Catholic, I attended a Catholic college. So I'm more than able to discuss transubstantiation, the mysterious process by which the bread and wine used in communion become the body and blood of Christ. Literally, every bread atom and every wine atom is transformed into a body atom and a blood atom. Bread and wine exist no more. I've also taken part in more Protestant communions than I care to count. In fact, with a little prompting, I can give a rough overview of consubstantiation, complete with the differences among the three major strains, Zwingli's symbolic representation, Luther's joint existence of Christ and the material elements, and Calvin's joining with Jesus in heaven. And what issue could be better to discuss, given the widely reported debate over whether Protestant, uh, whether President Biden and other Catholic politicians who support abortion rights should be allowed to receive communion? You see, in Catholicism and in certain types of Protestantism, communion isn't open to everyone. There are other considerations and requirements, and you can be turned away if the powers that be think you haven't met them. It's a little like that famous Seinfeld episode. Most of you look like you remember Seinfeld even if you didn't watch it. But that episode called The Soup Nazi. Only here, some people seeking a serving of wafer and wine and don't meet the criteria which the authority figures dispensing them demand, are turned away as he shouts, no communion for you. So I told my wife, thanks, but no thanks, I'm all set. Then you're on your own, she replied. In retrospect, I should have taken them as a warning. Instead, I forged ahead. And I wrote a wonderful sermon, wonderful sermon, I do say so myself. And I proudly told her that when I finished. After congratulating me, I looked to see if her fingers were crossed, she asked which account of the Last Supper I used, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, I replied. Taken aback, she said, John's version was drastically different from the other three. I reminded her that it has bread, and it has wine, and that's what counts. Bread and wine, she laughed. There's no bread and wine in John's account of the Last Supper. He washes his disciples' feet. If we use John for communion, people would take off their shoes and dip their toes in a giant chalice filled with water. That's where I got her. 
There's no blood washing in John 6, 51 to 58. The section for this Sunday, I said, with a smirk, never smirk at my wife. To my surprise, though, she agreed. But only because John's Last Supper is in chapter 13 of his gospel. Getting concerned, I asked what John 6, 51 to 58 was. Oh, that, that's the lectionary reading that many ministers won't touch, she explained. Instead, they use the Hebrew Bible that Linda read so beautifully from, or the epistle reading. She suggested I restudy the passage. Yeah, I did, begrudgingly, since the sermon was done. And when I finished, it was still done, as in discarded. Shame. Did I tell you it was a wonderful sermon? But it was the wrong sermon. Oh, I had one or two things right, like the bread and wine. Only I didn't heed the interpretive caution of Carolyn Lewis, who holds the Marbury Anderson chair in biblical preaching at Luther Seminary. That not every passage that mentions bread is about Holy Communion. And this passage, she adds, definitely isn't. Besides, at least when it comes to bread, John's obsessed. As Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my wife's favorite preachers, astutely says, follow the bread and it will lead you to the source of all life. That is John's gospel in a sentence. But then she goes on to say that bread is not for believers only, but rather it's bread for the world, one that God so loves, and for everyone in whose stomach has ever growled. Unless you be confused, in the readings leading up to today's, Jesus proclaims, I am the bread of life. But not the polished bread of the rich and privileged, made for the best grains by the rawness of his language john's jesus lets us know he's the coarse bread of the poor and the downtrodden made from barley ah, all the cheap bread that was the first harvest and it was lousy bread but it was cheap it was hardly bread at all if this passage that we have today was a movie Quentin Tarantino directed. John starts with very polite Greek, using the polite Greek word for eating, then transitions to more graphic words, chomping, chewing, devouring. Somebody once said they could just picture Jesus' mother saying to him, close your mouth when you eat the graphicness of this. And it's not just eating, not just eating Jesus' body, but his flesh, his bloody flesh. Jesus declares his flesh to be the real food and his blood, the real blood, which must be consumed and exhorts his listeners to bring a hearty appetite to this eating Sally May, congregational minister of Red Ballot's Day, <clears throat> tells of her angst over the language, eating my flesh and drinking my blood, confessing for her it has always been a struggle to find value in this section of John's gospel. It's so raw, she says, so gory, so gruesome sounding, as someone said when I shared my reservations, so icky, John's icky gospel. I like that, John's icky gospel. And the Ellen Shaw, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church out in Michigan says, if we truly listen to Jesus, if we listen to his gross and grotesque words, 
His assertion sounds uncomfortably cannibalistic. And she admits to knowing several pastors who try to avoid preaching on this passage simply because it is cannibalistic. Sounds like what my wife cautioned me about. And many of Jesus' adherents went even further, ceasing to follow him after hearing the language and actions that are more suggestive of Hannibal Lecter than the Son of God. What's happening here? Has Jesus lost it? Or has John? Hardly. John's Jesus meant to shock. He meant to wrap Jesus' message in a cloak woven of the vulgar and the salacious. I think it's clear that Jesus was stirring the pot on purpose, says Rick Morley, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church out in New Jersey. He wanted to say things that deliberately challenged people even to the point of having to decide they have to leave. One thing is clear here, Morley continues, Jesus isn't about people pleasing. He's not about laughing and smoothing out the wrinkles so that everyone could go away happy and come back again happy. He's not about just saying and doing anything to pack the joy. A test of sorts. One group John went out of his way to offend, particularly, was the Jews. Understand, John was writing at a time that Christianity was transforming itself into its own separate religion, breaking off from being a Jewish sect. So, John contributes to this act by associating Jesus with events and fulfillments from the Hebrew Bible. But he outdoes himself in today's passage. The Hebrew Bible in numerous places deliberately prohibits consuming blood and stipulates that it must be drained from any meat that is to be eaten. So the imagery of eating flesh and drinking blood in John's gospel not only violates this law, but slaps it in the face by holding that this sacrilegious act is essential for humans to be joined through Jesus with God. Ouch! That hurt. And as if face slapping wasn't Enough. He follows up with face rubbing by having Jesus repeat this over and over again. You don't get the message? Here, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. How many husbands have heard that? But then, whatever Jesus says in John's gospel, he says over and over, usually in lengthy discourses. William Willimon, some of you may know him, he's a <clears throat> well-respected Methodist theologian, retired Methodist bishop, once told a friend about a wonderful Canadian movie he saw that goes word by word through John's entire gospel. His friend said he had also seen the movie. And midway through, his wife looked at him and asked, will Jesus ever shut up? Well, here's a hint. He doesn't. Now, some of you may argue that despite John's intent, despite his language, despite his omission from the Last Supper, this passage is still communion by any other name. Doesn't Jesus say, and we heard it, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Doesn't he say, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. 
And doesn't he say, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Remember, I, I told you about the repetitions. However, if you insist on equating it with the consistent versions of communion in the other Gospels and in Paul, be careful. There is an essential difference. The other communion accounts bind humanity to a dying Christ at the absolute end of his earthly ministry. John binds humanity to the living Christ midway through his ministry. This isn't a Christ of sacrifice for sin. This is a Christ of spirit or life. Carol Angles, who I mentioned earlier, calls life the one central theological plane in John's gospel. And she says that, quote, life according to John means that which you need for your life to be sustained. God provides that life is abundant, that eternal life is not something you can conveniently and conventionally postponed to your future. But it is your promise in the present, your promise in the present, that any claim about life with Jesus, life with God, means an abiding, a unity, a reciprocity, and a oneness. And here's the key, according to Reverend Lewis, Quote, it means real relationship, here and now. That is not a remembrance of Jesus' past life or a hope for a future life, but life lived in the moment as God's grace upon grace. Which leads us to ask, how do we live that life? How do we become one with the living Jesus? The answer comes earlier in the gospel in what the late Father Raymond Brown, and he was perhaps the greatest of all the John scholars taught down at Union, theological, brilliant terms, the sapiential section, writings that express the wisdom of Jesus, the everyday practices that his followers should adhere to. All of them can be reduced to Jesus' simple injunction. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Provide them all manner of substance and a sustenance, not simply food. Clothe them. Visit them. Comfort them. Heal them. Seek justice for them. These are the components of the spiritual glue that bonds us to Jesus, the living Jesus. These are the things we must do, not only for our lives, not only for their lives, but for the life of the world. Not in remembrance of him, but as part of him, just as he is part of us, living, not dying, when he charged us, living, not dead, because he charged us. You follow the bread, Barbara Brown Taylor says, and the bread leads you to life, not only for you, not only for your flock, but for every lamb of God. Amen. <laughs> Just for love.
I bid you go forth this new week and remember, like the forest and the trees, sometimes we can't see the feast for the food. We see our plate and we concern ourselves with our sharing with Jesus, whether it be a communion or all through our lives. And forget that Jesus said the food that he offers is food for everyone. And that by eating it in the right spirit, more food appears. The food that we take for ourselves becomes a feast for all. Go forth this week. Eat the food. Share it with the other lambs of God. That you'll know that you have become one with the living Christ and through the living Christ with the living God.